next 90 minutes or so. I, I, assume, I assume Newton told you that this is going to be a longer than normal presentation. So I really appreciate you guys being here because uh, I know that you're all very busy and, and um, have important things that you need to do. And I hope that, that you feel like your time um, is worth it to be here. How many of you guys have heard about team-based learning? So um, have any of you guys actually do it? So, so um, can one of you guys do it? Hopefully, by the time this lecture is over, you'll all be like really inspired to go out there and start teaching with team-based learning. That's my goal for this presentation, is that, that by the end of this, you're all going to run out and try and find some learners that you can do team-based learning with. So what, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to um, uh, actually have you um, understand the essential elements of what team-based learning is all about, and then give you a little bit of background of, of where it came from. Um, where this whole pedagogy came from, give you just a little teeny tiny taste of it. Um, I really wanted to do just like a whole workshop, but um, uh, I understood that this was supposed to be more of like a grand round kind of presentation, but I can't, I just can't do a total lecture. I'm just not in me. So we're going to have a little bit of interaction. And then I'm going to give you um, a little bit of some of the research that's been done in TBL. So that, that's what we're going to uh, hopefully accomplish this morning. So, um, what is team-based learning? Basically, um, it's an active small group-based instructional method that was created to replace lectures. And, and Larry Michelson um, started it in the 1970s when his um, learners, he's a, a teacher in business, went from something like this to something like this. And he said, I just can't do this. I can't teach large groups of learners. It's just not going to work for me. So he created team-based learning. And it, it went from uh, undergraduate education to medical education um, about 15 years ago. And that's when I started doing it. And I started it with uh, uh, medical students in uh, the clerkship and uh, have really been enjoying it ever since. So, um, okay. <laughs> Hey, yeah, maybe if I signed in to Wi-Fi, it would quit asking me to. Well, or do you need to be in Wi-Fi for this? No, no, I don't. Can you just do this with Wi-Fi? Oh. So. Oh, but why is it not coming? Yeah, coming Thank you so much. Oh, and this is my cat, Max. For any, for any of you guys that are cat lovers, he's awesome. Okay. So back to... Um, one of the things I love about team-based learning is that it's low-tech. I don't usually use slides. I don't usually use any technology. Um, and. That's something I really like about it. So basically, well, it was originally designed for 200, but some people do it for classes up to 500. So uh, it's a little more challenging with big classes, but you can do it with big classes. And we can talk about how to do it with big classes. So basically, you take a class that's kind of like this, and you just put them into groups. Um, and, and so it was meant to replace lectures. So there's three components of team-based learning, and these are the three components you can see right here. Um, the first phase is pre-class preparation. You guys have all heard of flipped classroom. So the students uh, prepare before they come to class. And then when they get to class, they go to the second phase, which is readiness assurance. So they take two tests, first an individual test, to make sure they understand the basic components that they were supposed to learn in the pre-class preparation. And then they get together with their small group and they take the exact same test. It's called the group test uh, as a team. Uh, then they kind of go over it with their uh, facilitator and they have an opportunity to appeal. And then they go on to the most important phase, which is phase three. Phase three is the application phase where they get really challenging problems and they have the opportunity to use what they've learned 
to help answer the challenging problems as a team. Now, the applications use what we call the four S's. And so every application has to meet the four S's. What the four S's mean is that every application problem has to be a significant problem. And what, what I mean by a significant problem is that the learners have to see that this problem will apply to them in future life. Every team gets the same problem. And the answer to the problem has to be a specific choice. That means it has to be one answer. Now, it doesn't mean it has to be multiple choice. Some people think it, it, it has to be a multiple choice problem. But it has to be one choice. So, for example, if you don't want it to be a multiple choice problem, the learners can come up with the answer. They can write it down on a piece of paper or a whiteboard. They can hold up the whiteboard. But they all have to come up with a single choice. And then they have to simultaneously reveal what the choices are. And those are the four S's. And you have to have the four S's for it to be a proper team-based learning application problem. Now, there's some essential components to team-based learning. First of all, the groups have to be properly formed and properly managed. What's generally meant by that is that the instructor has to put the group together. You, uh, students have to be made accountable for their work. And what, what that basically means is that you have to, generally speaking, grade the students for um, the, uh, in the readiness assurance process in some capacity. You have to hold them uh, accountable. If you don't hold them accountable, then there's no real incentive for them to do the pre-class preparation. So that's really important, the accountability. And they have to be accountable for both the individual work and the group work. So there has to be some kind of component of grading for both the individual work and the group work. The assignments have to promote both learning and team development. So it has to promote cohesion in some fashion. And the students have to get feedback, which is very frequent and very timely. So immediate feedback. They have to know the answers. You can't give them a test and then not get the answers to the test until next week. They have to know immediately whether or not they got their answers right. And those are the basic principles of TBL. So I'm going to show you kind of how that works in a little bit. OK. So now you may wonder why teams. Why is learning in teams something that, that's helpful? So in the work setting, you, you all know this, in the work setting, we all use teams because people have different competencies. And when we put people in teams, we can get more done. Well, the same thing kind of applies in the learning center, uh, setting. In education, we put people in teams because people can develop more. Um, when they're in teams. They can learn more knowledge and more skills when we put them in teams. And teams can solve harder problems than individuals can alone. So you can learn more when you're in a team than you can learn by yourself. And there's, there's some significant data behind that, which I'm going to show you in a, in a little bit. But first, we kind of have to understand the difference between a group and a team. Because we throw those different words around a lot. So let me ask you a question. Is this a group or a team? So I'm, I'm hearing group. How many of you guys think it's a group? <coughs> I see most people raising their hand. Anybody think it's a team? I see one, one person thinks it's a team. OK, so, so, you're, so you say it's a soccer team. So why, why does it look like a soccer team? So they have uniforms. So there's some team components. Somebody who thinks it's a group, why do you think it's a group? Well, there's only three. There's, there's only three. Well, what was that? They're not, they're not organized. They're not really moving towards a goal. They're, yeah, kind of, yeah, quite disorganized. So. Would you, would you say that this is maybe a group aspiring to be a team? They're, they're, they're moving in the right direction. Well, maybe. 
mo moving in some direction. So, um, yeah. And, and what this, this photo is meant to illustrate is that when you first put a group together, even if you call them a team, it t there's some factors that have to be in place for a group to become a team. And these are some of the factors. Teams have to be committed to the welfare uh, of the group. Teams have to trust each other. And groups have to become teams over time. And there have to be factors that you have to put into place. They have to interact for a good period of time. Learning teams have to share resources, especially intellectual resources. They have to share challenging tasks. And they have to get frequent feedback. And I talked about that feedback that, that your learners need. If you're going to give them a task, they need that feedback right away. How did we do on the test? They can't get that feedback a week later. So let's talk about a little bit of the science behind what we know about teams um, and, and about TBL in general. One of the things we know, and I think it's pretty well established, is that lectures are not the best way to learn. And I, I, I hate saying this as I'm giving a lecture. But, but we know this. We know this, that you, you learn the most at the very beginning of the lecture. And then people's attention starts to wane. And even, even a, for a very good lecture, you kind of forget stuff over time. It's just, it's not very effective. I mean, lectures were developed in the Middle Ages when people didn't have books. So to be using lectures a lot is just not, it's, it's outdated. We really shouldn't do it. In, in contrast, when people get together and they have to solve problems and they have to argue with each other about it, retention is much better. Uh, I was doing a review about uh, collaborative testing um, in particular. Um, retention is much better when people take tests together. The actual process of collaborative testing, arguing with somebody, having a different point of view, um, can, and resolving conflict in the process of making a decision really ups knowledge, ups retention. Now, there's some things we know about high-performing teams. We know that for some of the key member variables is that you have to have a team where there's enough knowledge, enough skill, you have to have the right kind of tasks and the right kind of motivation. And we talked about having accountability. Uh, the students have to have that <coughs> motivation. They have to know that they're going to be held accountable. There's been research about the proper team size. One, I think one of the mistakes we make, we put small groups together. And a lot of times, we, you know, it's like we have a class of 300 students. It's like um, we put groups together, but oh, there's gonna, we don't have enough small group rooms, so let's put small groups of 10 students together. Well, 10 students is not a small group. It's a small classroom. The ideal small group number is five to seven students. Less than five, you don't really have the talent. More than seven, then it's too big. You don't have the cohesion. And we've actually done research on that. We did this study where we um, took our students uh, our clerkship students, we took a, actually a bunch of clerkship students, we had like five different schools involved in this. And we had them take um, the National Board Shelf Exam in Psychiatry, first as individuals, then as a team. And we looked at performance, and we looked at cohesion. And we found that um, the larger the group, uh, the better the performance. Um, groups of seven did very well. Um, groups of uh, six and seven didn't do significantly better than each other, but they did significantly better than groups of four and five. Four just dropped off the map. Now, that doesn't surprise anybody, right? Of course, a group of seven medical students is going to do better than a group of four medical students when it comes to taking a tough test. When we looked at cohesion, though, uh, we found that a group of seven, the cohesion is going down. So, and this, this is the same study. For cohesion, we used two different measures. We used a, a survey called the Team Performance Survey and a survey called the Workplace Emotional Intelligence Profile, which is a measure of how well students can read each other, most, how, how well they 
their emotional intelligence goes up over time when they're in a group. And we found that groups of five and six did better in terms of their cohesion, in terms of their emotional intelligence. Groups of seven started to fall off. So the ideal group number in terms of performance and cohesion seemed to be six. And so now with our TBL groups, we try to make them groups of six. Another thing we discovered is that groups do better when they're diverse. And there's been a lot of research looking at this um, in terms of gender diversity. Um, it groups of all, actually groups of all men, don't do as well as groups that are men and women. Groups of all women don't do that. Um, but uh, heterogeneous groups almost always do better than homogeneous groups. Over time, it takes longer for heterogeneous groups to um, develop cohesion, but diverse groups almost always do better over time. Uh, mechanics, I talked about the importance of the instructor forming a group. What do you suppose happens if you let students put their own group together? What's that? Oh, I it's not diverse. They get together with their friends. So when you get together with your friends, um, then you have very homo homo homogeneous teams. And then they're uneven teams. So you have um, some teams are much stronger than others. Um, so if you're going to be putting together a team based learning classroom, never let students, never let them put together their own teams. When we assign groups, uh, it depends on the class. Um, you always want to do it so that there's enough talent in the group and that's spread out, and then there's enough diversity. So for our psychiatry clerkship, for example, we would start off by asking, does anybody have any experience? Were in there are any psychology majors or anybody who has any counseling experience? And we would put them at the front of the line. Um, and then we'd ask for non-science non majors, put them at the front of the line. Um, and then we would ask people to line themselves up based on distance born from Galveston. From Galveston. Um, and then we'd have them count down so that they would all be separated out from each other. So anybody that was a non-science major would be separated and they'd all be in different groups. Now what do you suppose doing, um, having people line up based on where they were born does? Why would I do it that way? Well, it diversifies region of the country. It also diversifies, you know, all the urban students separates them out, the rural students separates them out, the out-of-state students, and then the international students. They're all separated out. Um, and also, I find out where all the uh, students are born, which is kind of interesting. So that, that's that's how I do it. But basically, it's the the fundamental principle <coughs> is that you want to um, separate people so that you can divide up the talent and make um, your teams diverse. Oh, no, I have a question about when you say diverse groups of, say, diverse groups take a longer time to develop a cohesion, what time period are you talking about? Because sometimes you might just have a, you know, one class kid, one you want to divide up the group, and then sometimes you don't want to keep them together so long. Do you have a time frame in mind how long you can keep that group together? Um, right into my next slide, which is maturity. The longer a group is together, the higher functioning it becomes. So if you're just doing it one time, it's not important because you're not going to get the power of a team if you're just doing it one time. You're going to get increased engagement when you do TBL one time. But if you want um, new groups, people don't really know each other, they don't really trust each other, they're, they're, they're groups, they're not teams. They're like, you know, the soccer players. Well, maybe not that bad, but. Um, but long-term groups, people know each other, they trust each other, they know who, their strengths and weaknesses, and so they can really function well. And if you're, you know, doing this over like a course, 
um, you want to keep your team together for the length of the course. Um, in some places like Wright State University, they keep their teams together for the entire year. And that they, throughout different courses. Because the longer they're together, the higher functioning they become and the greater their ability to solve problems. They really need <coughs> That makes sense when you think about it. You know, clinical teams are the same way. Is there something called syndrome teams? That after that, they... You get sick of each other? Uh, I don't think there's been research to suggest it when a team has been together too long. Um, so, yeah, I'm just wondering whether you want to keep them from year one to year four all together or just... Tip typically, the, the schools that do this throughout will only keep the teams together for one year. And sometimes the students will go, no, keep us together, but they usually do one year. <coughs> Uh, the task the task that you have them do is important because some tasks lend themselves to teamwork and some don't. Uh, a task, for example, has to be challenging enough that you need the power of the team. You don't want to give them something too easy, uh, but you don't want to give them something too hard either because that'll discourage them. And you don't want you want something that is really the team. Uh, it makes sense for a team to do it. For example, you don't want to give them a, uh, a research paper because then they'll just divide it up. Um, you want something where they can sit around and use their brain to answer the problem. Uh, and it also has to be a significant task, one that they see as worthwhile of doing. We already talked about accountability. You have to hold them accountable or they won't prepare. And if they don't prepare, it's going to ruin the entire class. I, I made this mistake when I first started doing PBL because um, I was so excited about it. I wanted to do it everywhere. And so I did it in my neuroscience class. Um, but we couldn't require students to come to a lecture. So, you know, I, I put together the teams and everything ahead of time, but the students didn't all show up. And that just messed up everything. And, and so it was a it was a disaster. So you have to make sure that the students are so um, are held accountable, um, or everything looks fall apart. So we have a situation where our lectures are not the same like, so how do we follow up? Well, if you make it part of their grade, then then it doesn't matter if it's required or not; they will show up. Attendance, it, it, you don't have to have attendance if it's part of their grade um, because the students will not skip things when it costs them points. They will tell you, I can't come. What do I do about the fact that I'm going to miss this quiz? So it's, it, it's like you can say, well, you, you don't have to come, but you're going to get a zero on the quiz. Right. So it's, it's like the lecture is not required, but the quiz is. And the only way you can take that quiz is during the lecture. And you, if you have a quiz during the lecture, they will all show up. We would already talked about feedback. Um, for feedback, we use these little scratch-off tickets, which are lots of fun. You get immediate feedback with these scratch-off tickets. And it's very motivating. Let me see in a minute. Actually, you'll see right now um, because um, this is we're getting to the point in the lecture where everybody gets bored, so we've got to get you guys uh, working. So I have, just to see how well you guys are paying attention, I have a little quiz. Um, this is your readiness assurance quiz. Your pre-class preparation was um, the lecture. So this is, um, this is a little quiz. It's five questions, and we're going to start off by taking it individually. And usually I give people about a minute per question. So here we go. So 
this is your individual test. Um, it's closed book. Well, you don't have a book, but um, typically this is closed book. You do it by yourself without any teammates. Okay. Does anybody need more time? Okay, so now um, that was the individual test. So what's next? The group, the group test. Very good. So the group test is still closed book, um, and you do this with your team. So, did I go all over the place? So if you could um, get together in groups of maybe. Why don't you get together in like groups of three? There's like uh, six people over here, so we can get two little teams over here. And if you could kind of move, um, Nathan, you can turn around. Um, and for the group test, we're going to use our little scratch-off ticket. Um, and uh, so the way this works, so don't don't start don't take the test yet. Don't take the test yet. Let me explain how this works. I see people are already jumping to taking the test. So the way this works is you're going to use this little scratch-off ticket. And uh, this, is, um, this is a lot of fun uh, because you decide with your group what you think the right answer is. And then you find somebody in your group who you think is not a very impulsive person. Um, and you give them the scratch-off ticket and you let them scratch it off. And a good thing to use is like a dime or a pen or something like that. If you get it right, if you get it right on the first scratch, then you get a little star. You're rewarded with a little star, which is very exciting. You get a little surge of dopamine. Um, and, uh, cause that's worth four points. Now, if you don't get it right on the first scratch, that's okay. You get another chance. Uh, but you get a two point penalty. If you get it right on the second scratch, you get two points. And if you get it right, uh, if you don't get it right then, you still get one more chance, but then it's down to one point. So there's just a couple rules with uh, a couple rules with this. The first rule is that you want to scratch one at a time, one question at a time. Some teams like to go all the way through before they start scratching. But it's very important to scratch one at a time. And the reason is because every time you go through, every time you scratch through, you find out who in your team knows what they're talking about and who doesn't. And this is, this is what we call norming the team. So that immediate feedback is very important. The second, the second uh, thing to remember, um, and I, I tell, um, so, sometimes this is more important than others, is when teams first get together, people don't know each other. They're very polite. They don't like to argue with each other. They raise their hands and stuff. And I tell people, uh, don't, don't be polite. This is about learning. This is not about points. So you want to kind of mix it up a little and argue, because the more you argue, the more you'll learn. So the teams that spend a little more time arguing will learn more, and um, then that, that's better. So I'm going to give you guys each a scratch-off ticket. I'll tell you when to start. Um, then. Um, what I typically do is have people, is there a way to put this up or will it never happen again if I put it up? Yeah. <laughs> um, so everybody's done. So, um, so it was four points each. So, um, who got who got a twenty? So did everybody? Everybody got a twenty. So, um, so it was it was easy. Um, did everybody get a twenty as an individual? Pretty much. Pretty much. So this is why you want to give it to the least impulsive member of the team. I just don't pay attention. Okay. So this this is this is a pretty
pretty easy test. Usually I don't make it quite so easy, but it also shows that you guys are paying attention, which is good. Now, why do you suppose I have the teams put the answers on the board? It, it's a little bit of a competition. So what, what, is, what, what does that do? It, 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 does, it does a couple of things. It, it builds team cohesion. Um, but it also helps the team see, relatively speaking, how challenging the rat was. My rats usually aren't quite that easy, as this one was. So if they have a particularly challenging rat, they can, and, and they may be demoralized because they didn't do so well, they can say, well, maybe the other teams didn't do so well either. It also helps if you have a team that's act is kind of slow, and all the other rats, uh, all the other teams have their scores on the board. I can say, uh, team six, we need you guys to finish up. Now, we usually time um, the, the rats, the IRS and GRS, we give, in my clerk soup, we give them 1.25 seconds per item. Um, and, but typically, they don't need quite as much time for the group rat as they need for the individual rat. Um, so, how did, how did y'all enjoy doing this? We can ask you a question in terms of timing. Mm -hmm. So, how do you handle doing the accommodation? Typically, um, it's not an issue. Uh, and the reason is because these are low stakes. They're not for assessment, they're for learning. And so, uh, even though everything is important to students, um, the high stakes that we we give accommodations for the high stakes test, uh, but not for the low stakes test. Now, if a student ever brought it up, if a student ever made an issue out of it. Now, honestly, I haven't had a student make an issue out of it, and I've been doing this for over ten years. Um, but if a student ever made an issue out of it, I would just say, "Well, you can come early and uh, and start taking the test early." Because I've seen this over the listserv. Um, we have a TBL lister. What do we do about students with accommodations? So a student can come early and take and take the IRAC. Um, and that that would be one way of handling it. But it, they don't usually make an issue. Out of it. And since those are close standards, you guys do the group work, or you know, the time test is the group. It. The groups all get the same score, but even with. Thus, when we did this with our national board test, um, the students came early to take the individual test, but with the group test, um, it was it was not an issue. It's just because the no there was no way you could deal with the accommodations with the group work because it was a it was a group test. Um, we give them 1.25 <coughs> seconds per item. Second? I'm sorry, minutes. <laughs> minutes, 1.25 minutes per item. Yeah. The questions are usually more challenging than this. Okay. Other questions about the readiness assurance process. What we usually do after the um, IRAT and the GRAT is there's appeal. And immediately after the students complete their group RAT, they have an opportunity to appeal any questions that they missed. You can appeal for one of two reasons. Either if you think that the question is factually wrong, you can see if you can find a citation in the pre-class preparation or even in another source that, can, that you can cite um, for this is, I believe this question is wrong and here is the reason why. Um, and you can, you can um, turn that in to the instructor or we sometimes we talk about it in class, depending on how big the class is. If you have a class of 300 students, you would not necessarily want to talk about it in class. Um, or if you feel like it's a poorly written item, and uh, more often I get appeals for this is a poorly written item, um, if you can rewrite the item and um, the instructor thinks it's well written, you can get an appeal for that. And when my students appeal in a clerkship, which is a small number of students, um, I will appeal directly with them in class. I'll only give credit to the appealing team. Um, and I'll just go directly up there and write the, uh, if they have like a 24, I'll mark out the 24 and give them a 26. 
which is very reinforcing. Students love seeing them, their teams have points go up. So uh, what, do you, what do you think is the advantage of the appeal? Further one. Yeah. The students are very reinforced to just go jumping back into their textbook um, to see why they missed the item. And most of the time, they're like, oh, this is why we missed it. Um, but they, they uh, appreciate um, why they missed it, and it really does reinforce the item. Um, no. Now that would make the students upset. <laughs> but I make them all actually go through the process. So um, I'm not going to give it to this team just because this team did it. They all have to go in there and find the citation. They all have to write out the appeal. So they're, they're not going to ride on the coattails of the other team. Yeah, but you have to write it out now. You have to find the citation. You have to write it out. Okay, so now we're going to go to the third phase. Now, the third phase is the most important phase of TBL. And a lot of people get confused. When they go to a TBL workshop, they, um, they get so enamored with the scratch-off tickets. Scratch-off tickets are fun. Um, that they think TBL is the IRAT and the GRAT. But if you just do IRATs and GRATs, the students get upset with you because they don't like being tested. Uh, and, and really, TBL is the third phase. If you're only going to do one component of TBL, you should just do the third phase, which is the application of the knowledge that they learned in the pre-class preparation. So I'm going to um, give you a little bit, uh, a little taste of that also. For the application phase, we use these cool cards, um, these little A for E cards. So I'm going to pass out these A for E cards to your team, and um, you can just join. Either one, you have two teams to, to choose from. Um, so, <laughs> so this is a challenging problem, um, and in this this problem. Um, pretend that you are, you and your colleagues are going to design and implement a new course, interdisciplinary course in pathophysiology to replace most components of pathology and physiology and a large segment of pharmacology. And it's going to be a year-long course and it should include periodic clinical correlations to encourage students to begin clinical reasoning. So I imagine you guys do stuff like this. Everybody does. So, this is the question. Which is the best approach to assigning grade weights to the TBL components in this course? You have five choices. And what I want you guys to do is I want you to talk to your peers. And you have to make a decision. And when you make a decision, um, um, Raise your hand, but don't raise the card yet. Because what I want you to do is I'm going to ask you um, at some point, um, I'm going to ask you to simultaneously raise, the, raise, have a person in your team raise the card that corresponds to your choice. So um, this shouldn't take more than five minutes, but maybe even less. But go ahead and talk with your, your teammates. And when you have made a decision, um, raise your hand, and then we'll um, come back to the, the large group. OK, so what I'm going to ask people to do, um, I can hear there's been lots of good discussion, but I'm going to ask people now to make a choice. and so. What I want you to do is to have a representative from your team. I'm going to count to three. And at the count of three, I want a representative from your team to hold up the card 
that corresponds to your team's choice. Just one card. Oftentimes, there's usually one team that holds up more than one card. Um, but I don't want to see that because that's not that's not what we allow. So, um, is everybody ready? This is the exciting part. Okay. Okay. Is everybody ready? Yes. Newton says everybody's ready. No, I said I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> oh my. So we have we have a B, B, D, and E. Okay. So, oh, is that a C? We have a B, C, D, and E. Okay. Well, that's that's exciting. So why don't we why don't we start with the B group? Share with us your thinking about why you like B. Oh, you are B group too. Oh, you are C group. Okay, I'm I'm all confused. And share with us your thinking about why you like B. You can say whatever you like. So C group, tell us what you're thinking. Why do you like C? Um, in terms of wing group, it's, a, it's kind of a standard setting process for C, where the faculty essentially would agree. So everyone would agree on different things and campus as well, or what they think is right. So from the standpoint of quality assurance, Now we had more than one team like D. So let me hear from one of the D teams. Why did you like D?
one of the other D teams like to weigh in? And then there was an E team. So what we thought about similar things in terms of an D team with uh, uh, actually cross conferences that this is an approach, and uh, the first two are not the approaches. Uh, we did not pick D over E. The reason we actually picked D is because we also acknowledge that the student involvement and role in terms of the grade. And they are the group, so they get to determine the CDL uh, component grade. But we also felt that the faculty uh, still have the responsibility for the both overall. So the standard setting is faculty responsibility, and giving that up is basically being derelict in our duty. So that's why we did one. <laughs> now, were there any minority opinions that got um, kind of over? Uh, shouted by their, yeah, their group. So did anybody have their um, their minds changed by the argument? So I should have warned you ahead of time that um, there wasn't a perfect right answer. Um, because some of these some of these overlap with each other, as you might imagine. Um, but there is a principle behind this. And every application should have a principle. And as, as you heard already, some of the principles um, that, we, that I've talked about um, earlier in this talk um, are kind of brought out here. And one of the principles is accountability. You want students to um, be accountable for both individual group uh, individual work and group work. But a principle I didn't talk about is buy-in. And, and you, you guys brought, in, uh, brought up buy-in. It's very important to have the students buy-in, um, both faculty and students uh, buy-in. And um, D and E both um, help to have the students buy-in to TDL. You don't have to have 
you don't have to have buy-in by having the students set grade, weight, grade weights. You can have buy-in in other ways. But um, having the students help with grade weights is one strategy for helping with buy-in. Um, and so that would be an advantage of uh, D&E. Um, well, I also didn't talk about peer evaluation. The peer evaluation is another component of accountability. Um, and we could talk about the merits of graded versus ungraded. Uh, I can tell you what we did when we first started TVL and what we did with E. Um, because E, um, we said you have to have individual work, you have to have group work, and they each have to count. Um, and they have to count between this and this, and they have to count between this and this, and you have to have peer evaluation, and it has to count between this and this. But within these parameters, you get to choose. So that way we had individual work, we had group work, we had peer evaluation, but we let the students choose. So that way we had everything involved. So the faculty got to choose that we had everything involved, we got to choose the parameters, the minimum and maximum, but we let the students pick the details. One thing that you should know though is that we had an orientation first. And after the orientation, what do you suppose the students chose? What they learned, and, and you guys didn't really appreciate this because I gave you such an easy IRAP, is they always do better on the group wrap than they do on the IRAP. So they all chose maximum group wrap, minimum IRAP. Um, and as little as they could on the peer evaluation. So even though I have a clerkship where it's like every six weeks different students, the students always chose the same grade weight, which was basically the grade weights the faculty wanted. So the faculty basically chose the grade weight. By giving the students the choice, they, they had buy-in as well. It seems sneaky, but it's really not because it helped the students understand TBL. Um, and it also, um, you know, kind of helped, helped with the basic, um, uh, understand the basic principles. <laughs> <laughs> There's no grade for this. We used to do it. We used to do it for each clerkship, um, and then we we just after we did that for a few years, we just basically changed it. Um, for many years, we did 30% individual, 70% um, team, and then we did uh, a graded <coughs> peer evaluation. <coughs> and the reason we did it this way was, and you might have wondered why so much for group work. Well, it was a clerkship. TBL was only 15%. Everything else was individual. You know, the clinical evaluation and NBME, everything else was, in, was uh, individual. So there was only a very small component of the overall clerkship that was group work. Um, and if you want them to care about the group, you have to have a major component be group work. Um, now we have ungraded peer evaluation, and it's mostly qualitative. And we do that because we, we want the students to um, give each other um, good qualitative feedback. You know, you could talk about the merits of quantitative versus, qual I mean, of, of, of graded versus ungraded, and we don't really have time for that here. I have a whole workshop on that. Maybe I can come back some other time. So I'm going to talk to you. We don't have a lot of time, but I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about some of the research with TBL. Um, and start with the learning outcomes. People always ask me about learning outcomes. And I'm going to start with a, um, a study that was um, published by um, FATME in 2013, which was basically uh, an overview, a, a, a systematic review, um, best evidence in medical education. These are published by medical teacher, where she looked at every um, trial of team-based learning versus a valid comparator. 
Um, she looked at just a ton of studies. And 330 screen titles, she found 14 that was TBL versus a valid comparator. There were seven that reported significant improvements in performance. And, you know, statistically significant. Three that reported improvement but didn't comment on significance. And four that reported no change. So it's pretty good evidence that TBL improves academic Uh, I apologize for this slide, um, but this just shows what happened in our clerkship when we instituted TBL. Um, this first, <laughs> terrible, this is, this is psychiatry here. The second one is OBJ. Um, in the psych clerkship, we had kind of miserable, this is probably why I didn't fix the slide, we had kind of miserable shelf exam scores. They were in the 35th percentile. And then we instituted TBL, and we kind of stepwise instituted it. We did it slowly. But every year, our shelf exam scores went up. Now they're around the 60-something percentile. We stopped it in 2008. We had a nasty little storm in 2008. Some of you might have heard about it. Um, and so our clerkship just changed entirely. So we, the, the data really wasn't, uh, wasn't fair to compare it. Um, what happened in OB-GYN was when we first showed our shelf exam data to the OB-GYN clerkship, they were like, well, you, psychiatry can't beat us with shelf exam. So they, they instituted TBL in, in their clerkship, and their um, shelf exam scores went up too. So you could speculate why this happened, but I think it's you know kind of the same stuff that was shown in, shown in that systematic review. Now this is really interesting. Paul Coles looked um, at his pathology students. This is preclinical, um, and he looked at the top quartile of the class and the bottom quartile of the class, and he compared. Um, how students did on items that were taught via TBL versus items that were taught via conventional lecture. And what he found was um, that both sections of the class did better. Um, but the lower quartile did way more better, way more better, um, than the highest quartile of the class. So, and, and that's just because the highest quartile of the class does well anyway. So, Weaker students are brought up way more than stronger students. And you can kind of see that here. Um, the difference in scores was, um, percentage difference in scores was 7.9% for the lowest quartile, 3.8% for the highest quartile. So what that tells me is that the better students are bringing up some of their weaker classmates. Uh, and so for particularly weaker students, TBL, um, is, is really helpful. Now, as far as how students feel about TBL, the picture is a little more nuanced. Um, in that same study, the, the, the um, best evaluation in medical education, seven studies, and including mine, um, looked at learner reaction. This was what I published looking at my clerkship in 2004. Um, this reported significant dif difference favoring TBL, my study, my one study, one reported a significant favor for the comparator group, and then there were five that reported no significant differences. But none of these studies were long-term. If you look at long-term, and this is Wright State, which has a, basically a TBL curriculum, over time, students like it better. So when they first start, they're kind of like, oh, I'm not crazy about this, and especially since I seem to be teaching myself, my classmates know why I'm paying tuition, my classmates are teaching me. So it takes a while for students to really get used to this. And I have more data that shows it takes a while for students to get used to it. It takes a while for teachers to get good at it. So um, they're not going to be crazy when they first start. And I'll be crazy about TBL. Um, the last thing I'm going to show is a study that we did um, finish up in like 2013. Um, and when the DSM-5 was introduced, we had to change our curriculum in my clerkship. Everybody had to change it in their clerkship. So um, we decided that maybe we would get together with the other clerkship directors in the UT system. There's four schools in the UT system. And uh, we would uh, create one curriculum. And we would um, share it with each other. And that way it would be easier on all of us. <laughs> At least we thought it would be easier on all of us. Um, now, a couple of us, UTMB Galveston and 
Austin, we're, we're actually the same site, but we're, we're the same school, but we're two different sites. We already had TBL, UT Houston already had TBL, but San Antonio and Southwestern didn't. So we decided um, as we would introduce TBL to these two new sites, we would uh, look at engagement and we would look at value of teams and we would look at all sorts of other stuff. So what we did is uh, we, the Galveston folks, went and taught TBL to the San Antonio and the Dallas folks. Um, and then we developed this curriculum and then we looked at engagement, enjoyment, value of teams, and classroom evaluations. What we found was that engagement went up <clears throat> in San Antonio and Southwestern. It was already high in Austin. Austin's a, a weird place. They're all engaged for no good reason. Um, but um, almost all of the increase in engagement, the classroom engagement survey, had to do with increases in engagement, not from enjoyment. So the students were more engaged, but they didn't necessarily like it. Um, and probably if I went back and looked at my old data from 2004, that's what I would have found. The other thing we looked at was we looked at attitudes about the value of teams. Now this is pre and post. This is beginning of clerkship and end of clerkship. And Austin was high to start with. Um, so there were no changes in Austin. No changes in Dallas. And Dallas is um, one of the ones we, Dallas really only piloted TBL. They had like um, just a couple of sessions and a big curriculum. And Dallas is a really good program. Um, we saw changes in Galveston and Houston and also San Antonio um, where there were more changes. Um, changes in the value of group work, also Galveston, Houston, um, and San Antonio, uh, um, in, actually in Dallas. And the value of team survey looks at value of working with peers and, and value of group work. Um, now, as far as end of courtship evaluations, um, what we saw, you can see this is Galveston. Galveston, we've been doing TBL for, you know, 15 years. <clears throat> About 70% of students uh, will report that they feel like TBL uh, improves their ability to work in a team, helps them with interpersonal and communication skills, and increases their understanding of course material. Uh, Houston, um, and this is where Donnell Shadi um, was doing it, um, it's even higher, like 90%. Um, and Galveston and Houston had been doing it San Antonio, where they just introduced TBL, it was much lower. <coughs> oh, no, actually, no, this is Southwestern, uh, where they just introduced TBL, it was much lower. It was more like around 50%. And this kind of is the same thing that we found in the other studies. Where people first start doing it, the students are not as enthusiastic. But over time, like in Houston and Galveston, students are more used to it, the facilitators get better at it, the attitude So just to kind of summarize the data, um, it's, I think it's well established that TBL improves academic performance. I don't think there's any controversy, any doubt about that. Um, also that it increases attitudes about the value of teamwork. Um, students do perceive TBL as helping them to become better at working in a team and improving their interpersonal communication skills, but they don't always enjoy TBL. One of the interesting things is that even though students, um, their performance is improved, they don't necessarily think that TBL is helping them learn. And it's because they're so used to uh, the conventional way of, you know, lectures and studying and regurgitating what they've learned that it's such a different way of doing things. It's like, how can I be learning this? So the take home message from this is that when I orient my students, you have to orient your students if you're going to do TBL. I, I show them this data because I say, you know, you may feel weird about this. You have to know that the reason I'm doing this with you is because performance data, academic performance data is superior with this <coughs> pedagogy 
And that, <laughs> that is why you're getting this pedagogy, because I want you to do great on your um, tests, on your shelf exams, on step two, et cetera, et cetera. It's like you want to be great on this. And so, this, so getting buy-in um, is so important so that the students will um, appreciate why you're making them do all this pre-class prep and stuff. So anyway, it's almost time to be done. Um, are there any other questions that you guys have at this point? Um, well, there are studies that have looked at emotional intelligence and that students um, in TBL have increases in emotional intelligence. But the long-term studies I think you're talking about that, you know, do they do better like in residency and, and that kind of thing? Um, no, we don't have that yet, and we really do need that, but I haven't seen that yet, and that's kind of the, you know, um, the, the holy grail of, you know, TBL, and we need that, but so far, no. Well, because it's one faculty, because this is a replacement for lectures, and I think you have to remember, this is a replacement for lectures. So you can't give feedback for this any more than you could give feedback for lectures. Um, and and th that's, I think that's what you have to remember. Students can give each other feedback um, like you would in, um, from the peer evaluation. Um, but if you want to give uh, feedback to students, you have to work with them more one-on-one, -on -one, like you would in a you know, clinical teaching setting um, or another kind of small group setting. Thank you.